specifically Shoscombe Vale in the gorgeous county of Somerset. Lockdown finishes at one minute past midnight tonight so I'm off on a winter wild camp. I'm going to try and camp on the GHQ line. I'll explain what that's about later on. So a couple of miles in this direction and I'm going to revisit a site which has got a bit of an anomaly. It's an historical claim that doesn't appear to make sense but I'm going to try and give an explanation of what I think it may be. In other words, I'm going to have a guess. Tonight I'm going to be trying out my new tent. It's the Van Gogh Banshee 200. Really looking forward to using it. And I'll explain why I bought it. And I'm also going to try and attempt to cook a curry and rice and naan outside on my table and chair tonight with a wood burner going. Hope it's going to work. We'll see. And I've got, I've got Cobra beer, I mean, what else? And tomorrow morning, after I've packed up my tent, I'm going to explore two local points of interest quite close to the campsite. They're absolute gems, and I really want to share them with you. So there's a lot to get through on this video, so let's get started right here, actually. You okay with me here? Okay. I'll start off with the Wellow Brook which is flowing right underneath me at this lovely spot that lady just cut across through the fields on her horse. That was a really nice encounter. Been passing her a few miles coming out through the village of Wellow. So the River Wellow, the Wellow Brook, rises in the grounds of Ston Eastern Park several miles yonder that way. It flows down to Midsummer Norton and there it's joined by the River Somer, and then it flows along here and then when it gets to Midford it's joined by the Cam Brook and then the Ordnance Survey in Google Maps geographers refer to that stretch then as Midford Brook which then flows a couple of miles into the River Avon near Dundas Aqueduct. However, the Environment Agency don't recognise the name Midford Brook they classify the Wellow Brook to flow from Radstock all the way to its mouth at Dundas Aqueduct. It's December the 1st, the first day of meteorological winter today. It really is a gorgeous day. The Wellow Brook is running along the end of this field, just down a dip there. This is part of a Sustrans route designated as the Collier's Way. I made reference to the GHQ line. In 1940, because of the threat of invasion and the danger that we couldn't stop the invasion on the beaches of southern England, there was these various stop lines designated that were heavily fortified. And the idea was to try and stop the German advance, get into the Midlands in the industrial north. London had its own protection. 
it's not within the scope of this video to explain too much. So I'll put a link in the description right below this video. But you do see lots of pillboxes and tank traps and various military emplacements along here. I mean, here's a good example right here. Where we're going to be camping is right next to some tank traps. After the pillbox, the Collier's Way climbs up slightly, so it's running parallel to the Willow Brook, but cut into a hillside, in fact, the northern side of the valley of, of the brook. And you come to this crossroads, a single hill, and the Collier's Way will carry on through Shoscombe and then into Radstock. But I'm heading down here, back down to the Willow Brook, down single hill. But before we get to the camp spot and at the brook, I'm going to show you a place of interest. Coming down this steep hill, this is the site of the former Shoscom and Single Hill Hawk Railway Station on the Somerset and Dorset. You can see the course of the railway there where there's an old bridge. Something on here I spotted back in the summer and there's a slight anomaly. So it claims here that even Sherlock Holmes has been here because Conan Doyle the author of Sherlock Holmes novels, used Shoscombe, Old Place, the railway station, as, a, as a, a setting in one of his novels. In the casebook of Sherlock Holmes, Holmes and Watson arrive here to go fishing, in fact, which would tie in with the stream down there. And it also says, on our reaching our destination, a short drive took us to an old-fashioned tavern. Well, there is actually an old-fashioned tavern up there. But here's the problem I found. The casebook of Sherlock Holmes was first published in the Strand magazine in between 1924 and 1927. If you have a look at the timeline of the railway along here, it was originally single, then it was doubled, and this station didn't actually open until 1929. So my question is, how can Conan Doyle have used this station as a setting if it didn't exist at the time? Well, my own theory, and it is just a theory, it's a wild guess to be honest, is even though the station wasn't built until 1929, people probably knew that it was going to be built. There must have been some local pressure and demand for a station. And I do know that Conan Doyle visited the area in the 1920s. In fact, he was very into spiritualism and mysticism and used to visit a country house called the Grange at Dunkerton, not far from here, so it would make sense. So that's a possible explanation for that mystery. A Sherlock Holmes mystery, for want of a better expression. When I was doing a little bit of research looking into that in the summer, I came across some quite fascinating facts about Arthur Conan Doyle. He was actually born and raised in Edinburgh and studied medicine at Edinburgh University. And while he was there, there was other budding writers, including Robert Louis Stevenson. And Conan Doyle, in his own words, describes one of his tutors as a major inspiration at the time. Arthur Conan Doyle described this Professor Joseph Bell as a master of observation, logic, deduction and diagnosis. He's just described Sherlock Holmes, hasn't he? So Arthur Conan Doyle had a lifelong interest in the mystical subjects and the paranormal. And it's well known that he was actually fooled by some fake photographs which claimed to have fairies on. Uh, I'll put a slide up of that now. By today's standards, they're not very convincing, but if you put it in the context of the time. Conan Doyle was very famous on both sides of the Atlantic and he often went to America and he became friends with Harry Houdini, the famous escapologist. And Harry Houdini actually admitted to Arthur Conan Doyle, that his act was based on illusion and trickery. And he even visited Conan Doyle at his home and performed quite a convincing trick just to prove that it was based on illusion and trickery. And even then, Conan Doyle refused to believe it. He actually was firmly convinced that Houdini had unique magical and mystical powers. Houdini became quite a vocal opponent to spiritual movement because he could see people being conned. And Eventually, him and Conan Doyle fell out. They, they had a very, very public falling out and it ruined their friendship um, because even though he confided and, and demonstrated to Conan Doyle that his act was based on trickery, Conan Doyle just 
wanted to believe i think so much i mean nowadays we'd probably call it confirmation bias wouldn't we i mean but then hey it hadn't been invented in the 1920s <laughs> i mean people have been writing about it for hundreds of years but it wasn't actually codified until the 1960s so i, I found that quite interesting just a few yards further down underneath the old railway bridge here we are back at the wellow brook this is absolutely gorgeous round here And here's the tank traps, again, part of the GHQ line, another fortification. I'm going to try and camp in that field along there somewhere. Here's the thing I'm slightly got doubts about, whether I can get through this kissing gate here. I may have to unload load the bike, put the bags over, and then try and take the bike straight through. There's also quite a muddy patch down there. There is a, a footbridge. That's my new tent up then, the Van Gogh Banshee. Not bad considering I haven't put that one up before. The reason I bought it then, you can probably see it's a side entrance tent as opposed to getting in and out through the front, the bigger end. And I found in the winter when I spend more time in a tent, I think that's going to suit me because I'll be able to sit in there and have the bulk of the room around my torso and head area where it does go down um, limited space. That's where my head and my feet are going to be at night when I'm sleeping. So I think it's going to be nicer to spend more time in there plus my old tent was getting off 10 years old and it had been chewed by some sheep one night so it was the stitching was torn in a few places also it's really easy to erect because once you've put it up the first time I did it at home the other day you can attach the inner and the outer together and leave them together so when you erect it you just literally put the fly sheet up and it's there ready for you just stake it out with guy ropes and the other selling point was it's got a stuff sack where yes you can roll it up the traditional way and squeeze it in in effect like a tube or you can just pack it up in a stuff sack cram it in there's some draw cords which allow you to compress it without the poles in so it gets into the panniers much much easier so that's the selling points the one negative point I've heard people say about it is it doesn't have a lot of porch space. Well, I don't normally cook in the porch area anyway, I consider that too dangerous. I don't normally store a lot of kit in the porch overnight, so I don't think that's going to be an issue for me. It may be, I don't know, but tonight is going to be the first test. I'm quite looking forward to it. I'm going to get everything else unpacked now. It's just gone 4pm. I bought an old basher just to put all my kit on and I'll probably do some of my cooking on that tonight. I'll just run through the sleeping kit I bought out for tonight. You may have noticed on the bike shots for the first time for years I've bought out an old caramat closed foam cell mat. So I used that all through the 1980s and 90s. Very lightweight, it just folds up. I've got it underneath my sleep mat partly to protect the inflatable mat and partly to give it some extra insulation. The sleeping mat is the XPED UL7 SIN mat. I think that means it's seven centimetres in depth. The thermal efficiency that it's measured in R numbers and it's got an R of 4.9, which is very, very efficient. Ideal for winter camping. Gosh, Chris Whitty and Richard Valance would probably faint if I told them that. On top of that, I'm going to put my Softy 10 Harrier sleeping bag there's the Harrier 10, my sleeping bag. It's synthetic lining. It's got a comfort down to minus seven. I think it'll keep you alive to minus 12. I bought that in 1999, just before I went to the US for three months in 2000, because I knew I'd be crossing, crossing the continental divide in the winter. Then to finish off, I've got the ergonomic XPED pillow. It comes with these eyelets and I do actually use them. I put some elastic through that so I can just slip it through the sleeping mat and it stops it rolling around. 
in the middle of the night because I'm a side sleeper so I toss and turn a bit and lastly because it's winter I've got a cotton inner so that normally gives sleeping bags an extra season so I'm pretty sure I'm going to be fairly warm tonight plus the fact the temperature the forecast says the temperature's not dropping below three degrees tonight although I am by a river in a valley so it could well be misty and cold first thing in the morning. It's ten past five and it's dark already so let's try and get a fire lit. I bought a bit of dry wood with me and I've also gathered some fallen wood around the, the tent. There we go. Got some kindling ready. Gosh, I was so concerned getting the fire going, had my back to the tent and I looked behind me, got a tent, I got a light in the porch of the tent and I thought, what's that light over through the trees? thought it was a house and it's a full moon rising with a bit of cloud around it. That's absolutely amazing. It's like a big face looking at me. I just looked around and thought, what on earth is that? It's 10 to 6 now and I've started my curry. I soaked the rice for 10 minutes and then drained it just to get rid of all the starch and then I'm boiling it in some turmeric. I'm just steaming that for 10 minutes. I've also got a couple of naans wrapped in silver paper. I'm trying to warm them up by putting them on top of the rice as it's steaming. Now I'm going to cook the main curry. I've seasoned some chicken overnight, left it in the fridge. I'll put a list of the spices and herbs on the screen now. I'm now going to fry that with some mushrooms, a small onion and a yellow pepper in some oil with some garlic granules. I'm going to fry that until the chicken starts to brown and then pour some tikka masala curry sauce in. It's 7pm now and I'm sat outside my tent still. I've just finished my curry, I'm just chilling out with the beer, just heating some water up to do the washing up. How did it go? Well the meal itself was actually fantastic. The wood burner, I bought some dry wood from home as I did on the first test last week and one of my friends Will Pomery said to me how do you think it all manage with fallen wood in the winter, wet wood and the answer was I honestly just didn't know, I was hoping it'd be okay well, it, it wasn't great, to be honest. So I fired the, the Tom Shoe wood burner up and it's given off quite a lot of heat until I started cooking. Then I was trying to concentrate on the cooking and go over and tend to the wood burner and the fallen wood just basically just smouldered, started smoking. I gave up in the end, just let it go out. Also, I'm still not convinced by this seat. It's better than sitting on the grass, that's for sure. Although I've got the ground sheet, the basher, with all my cooking implements and food and everything on. So I could have sat on that. It's okay, but it'd be nice to have a nicer chair. But I just don't know what I could possibly bring cycle to in. So I'll probably stick with it. The table's fantastic. The spot is lovely. And as I was putting my tent up, a couple of ladies walked by with dogs. So the locals know I'm here. And of course, when I lit the fire you could smell it as well so I don't think it's a problem I'm right next to the stream and it's just it's a lovely sound it's a, going to be a lovely sound to go to sleep with and it's going to be a lovely sound to wake up next to in the morning another thing I meant to mention earlier on when I was discussing the GHQ line these uh, defensive fortifications which remain from the second world war I didn't realize until a couple of years back that there's actually some first world war pillboxes in this country. They're over on the east coast because the threat would have come from the North Sea. And I learnt that through a YouTube friend of mine, Tom Outdoors. He also camps and he's also passionate about local history. So that's really nice about hooking up with people with similar interests on the internet and YouTube. You just learn things. And when I started reading up about them, I discovered that the First World War pillboxes were, in this country at least anyway, were either circular or hexagonal so that's possibly where the name comes from because they would have resembled stunted pillar boxes uh, and also there's there's also a claim that 
pill containers, medicine pill containers of the day were similar to that. So they may have looked like medicine bottles. So may, possibly that's where the name came from. So that explains a lot. So I, I was always a bit confused why they were called pill boxes. And talking about learning from other people, another person I follow on YouTube who wild camps suggested put in fairy lights in as much light as possible round and inside your tent during the winter. It's not going to warm you up, but my goodness, doesn't it just feel really cosy and nice? So that's my little campsite. You may hear the brook right behind the tent. And then this is the ground sheet, the basher I bought out. It's just so nice just to be able to put everything out on there. The only thing is I've got to wash everything up now, so that's my next task. This is the Wellow Brook, about 10 feet behind my tent. This is the sound I'm going to go to sleep tonight listening to. How beautiful is this? Because it just meanders its way through this field. Gorgeous spot. It's so clear as well. And then that's looking back at my tent. A beautiful little spot. This is coming back up to the tent. With the lights around it, looking very cosy. It's my stove ready for the morning. Try and be as organised as possible. My bike's in an old British Airways big plastic bag to protect it from the weather. And there's the ground sheet I've been sat on. It's my table with my beer. That's my little stove area. Beautiful spot. December the 1st and it's so mild, it really is. It's 5 to 9 and I've just come inside the tent, it's starting to get a little bit chilly out there. That's not bad, is it, for December? It was a nice sunny day today, lovely winter's day. And then it started to become overcast and cloudy just as I was putting the tent up, which sort of worked in my favour because I think it's trapped the heating. I've got a couple of LED lights inside the tent, so it's nice and bright in here. It does say this tent, it's got inside hooks for lights, but I haven't been able to find them yet. I'm sure I'll come across them in the morning. I'll turn these lights out shortly, get in my sleeping bag, and I'll say goodnight, and I'll talk to you in the morning.